public interest. I am Malika Ramsey. This week we focus on the late president of Guyana, Mr. Lyndon Forbes Samson Burnham. As you would have known, the Oliver Tambo Award to the late president of Guyana has been recently making the news. And of course, the People's National Congress Reform and the Partnership for National Unity would have made some statements regarding that. With me is the leader of the People's National Congress Reform and leader of the opposition, Mr. David Granger. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Malika. All right, sir. I know you've recently made some statements regarding Mr. Burnham's work and his contribution to the liberation of South Africa, and you've been, to some extent, criticized uh, for those statements. If you can, you know, before we get deep into the discussion, shed some light on why is it that you strongly believe that uh, Mr. Barnum, even though he has already gone, uh, should be contributed, should be recognized and awarded for his work regarding the liberation of South Africa? Well, like, uh, it's a, an old story. I mean, truly enough, it has recently made the news, but the award, the companions of O.R. Tambo, um, Oliver Reginald Tambo, that was his full name, um, is a high award. It is given by the Republic of South Africa. Um, to foreign dignitaries. There are three grades, the gold, silver, and the bronze, and the gold is reserved for former heads of state. Um, we felt it was going to be um, an, you know, uh, an uncontroversial matter because nobody has ever doubted the contribution that Forbes Burnham made to the restoration or the, the establishment of democracy in South, South Africa and to the liberation of Southern Africa. I mean, I can quote instances from over um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, that demonstrated he was a uh, committed fighter for democracy and for um, human rights in South Africa itself and for the liberation of Southern Africa. So I was quite surprised that um, the controversy should have um, come to the newspapers and to the media um, mainly because it's, uh, some persons objected to the award. And in those objections, he said nothing about his um, fitness for the award. They didn't criticize what Forbes Burnham actually did. They simply seemed to be relying on, on extraneous matters, even though they may feel those matters are important. No one has attempted to diminish or to discredit the contribution that Forbes Burnham made to democracy in South Africa and to the liberation in Southern Africa. Before we talk, uh, get deep into the actual contribution of Mr. Forbes Burnham regarding South Africa, do you believe that the persons who are somewhat criticizing or doubting um, his contribution are saying that he should not be awarded? Do you believe that they're just being malicious and somehow trying to bring it to modern day politics? It's difficult to find out what the motives are. I mean, it is, it is certainly malice and it is certainly irrational because um, one would expect that if an academic were to make such a criticism, uh, he or she would take a balanced view uh, to show, well, did this person uh, make any contribution at all? Um, is the government of the Republic of South Africa completely mad that they made an award to somebody who uh, has absolutely no right to the award. Um, if so, you know, well, what were the, the factors in favor of such award and what were the factors um, mitigating against the award? So, uh, militating against the award. So, um, one would expect some balance, but there was no trace of balance in the petition which was sent to the government of South Africa. And in our case in Guyana, this was not a national petition. It was a petition sent up by a group, but it was a factual petition. And perhaps we can examine, you know, what work Mr. Forbes Burnham actually did, um, what contribution he actually made to the liberation of Southern Africa and to democracy in South Africa. But I feel that the criticism was, was um, unbalanced and it was malicious, yes. On to Mr. Burnham's works regarding um, South Africa, uh, recently I was privileged enough to listen to a speech whereby Mr. Burnham had said, I, the speech was um, broadcast in 1971, where he, the government of Guyana 
had committed to $50,000 a year for uh, South Africa. Your thoughts on that contribution and, and did we, we as in Guyana, get anywhere in helping South Africa? Well, I wouldn't start in 1971. I'd probably start in 1946, okay. <laughs> if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I'm not trying to be historical, but I'm just trying to show you how far was put in thought. Um, when he went up to London as a student um, after the Second World War, he met several other colonial students because we didn't have a university at the time, and Forbes Burnham won the Guyana Scholarship, as it was called then. And he met students from all around the world, young men who um, were from the colonies of Great Britain. At that time, Britain was a very large empire. And some of those friends were people like Seretsi Kama from um, what is now Botswana. I think it used to be called Basutoland. Mm -hmm. He met Kwame Nkrumah. He met um, uh, people from Nigeria, like uh, Abuba Katapawa Balewa, who became the prime minister. And he met people like Errol Barrow, who became prime minister of Barbados. So these were young people in the 1940s, still in their 20s. Some of them had actually served in the British Army or British Air, the Royal Air Force. But from that time, Forbes Burnham became involved in the League of Colored People, which it wasn't for Africans alone, it was also for Asian and other people who were colored in, um, in living in Britain at that time, people from Sri Lanka and India and Pakistan. And um, he also became involved in the Caribbean Labor Congress. And um, he came back to Guyana in 1949 really committed to liberation of um, these colonies from imperial rule. So I can trace Forbes Burnham's activism um, really to um, nearly, you know, uh, nearly 68 years ago when he was a student in London. Um, there were several incidents uh, over the ensuing years, one of which it was a riot in Nyasaland. Nea um, that was, um, it's now called Malawi. There used to be, the Brit Britain had these huge federations, and one was called the Federation of Rhodesia and Niazaland. And it was made up of Northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, and Niazaland, which is now Malawi. I don't want to get you involved with in British imperial history. But the point I'm making is that in the Legislative Assembly, that is what our National Assembly was called in those days, he actually made a speech. Um, criticizing the British action in um, Nyasaland. He criticized the British colonial action in Kenya. Um, he criticized um, the shooting in a place called Sharpville. It's called the Sharpville Massacre, in which uh, South African police shot down several um, Africans, these are black Africans, in, in a, a Sharpville. And around the world, that Sharpville Massacre, you know, sent out shockwaves. So if you look at um, Forbes Burnham's activism, you can trace it back to the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s. So now we come to your point, <laughs> 1971. Um, after Guyana became independent, um, Forbes Burnham met many of his old friends and he was approached by other leaders, particularly after 1970. And he went to his first meeting of the Non-Aligned Movement in Lusaka, Zambia in 1970. And he started to tour several African countries. And he became more aware of the plight of colonies in Africa, which had not yet gained their independence, um, particularly from Portugal. Portugal was the first European country to colonize uh, states in black Africa. That is south of the Sahara. Um, and it was the last to leave. And the rule was very vicious. Um, the Europeans went to, Brit to Africa to extract minerals, particularly gold, and to extract uh, human beings to work as slaves in the plantation. Don't forget Portugal at one stage owned Brazil, and many of the Africans from Angola and so were taken um, to, to work in the sugar plantations in Brazil. That is why you know, you know, over one third of the Brazilian population is African. But the point I'm making is that Portugal was one of the most rapacious countries in Africa. And 
As late as the 1970s and 1980s, Portugal had not yet given up its colonies, um, particularly in Guinea-Bissau, uh, São Tomé, Principe, uh, Angola, Mozambique. And um, our, uh, our Forbes Burnham, our government committed itself to assisting the liberation of those countries from colonial rule. And the Portuguese army was involved. It did oppress and it did suppress the liberation movements. In Mozambique, you had one called Frelimo, that is the Front for the Liberation of Mozambique. In Angola, you had several. Um, we supported the um, MPLA, which in Portuguese means the um, Movement for the Liberation of Angola, Movimento Popular de Liberação de Angola. And um, there was also the FAPLA, which is the Popular Forces uh, for the Liberation of Angola. And you also had um, UNITA, the uh, Movement for the Total Liberation of Angola. There had several movements. But we were a poor country, and Forbes Burnham, out of our poverty, donated 50,000 United States dollars to help the liberation movements and actually set up a high commission in Zambia, in Lusaka, Zambia. Um, to provide assistance and our diplomats in the United Nations and uh, non aligned movement actually actively supported um, the liberation of the southern part of the continent. So it was a tremendous effort. I remember in Zambia, for one, when the British pulled out, Guyana actually sent typists. They were so badly off um, that they did not have African typists, um, civil servants, you know, engineers. We sent help to um, countries in South, Southern Africa. So um, I think uh, people remember the most um, astonishing, I call it astonishing because the strategic significance of this act was really um, something that hurt Guyana, that is to say in 1975. Our government gave permission for uh, Cuban aircraft taking troops from Cuba to uh, Angola to land here at Timeri. Now, this is the Western Hemisphere, and um, the United States at that time was supporting South Africa, although it was under apartheid, and it was opposed to the liberation of uh, Angola, which was... Um, also supported by the, the communist countries. So that act, allowing a military aircraft to land at Temeri to refuel, because those days the airplanes didn't have the reach to travel from, from Cuba to Angola, and they needed to refuel, and they landed in, in Guyana. But was Mr. Barnum heavily criticized for that? I mean, that, that would also bring me to the, the question of how many groups or parts of society actually supported that kind of um, situation, that move. Well, you would always find elements in society with different points of view. It was dangerous because um, my information is that Guyana was actually warned by the United States to discontinue its support. And in fact, a year after that support started, that is in October 1976, a Cubana airline was bombed out of the sky off of Barbados and 11 Guyanese were killed. Uh, I regard, in my strategic analysis, I regard the bombing of the Cubana in 1976 as payback, as payback for allowing Cuban troops to land here to go to South Africa. So that was the first and the worst act of terrorism in the Caribbean, and I'm still convinced that if um, the United States had taken heed and had tried to persecute or prosecute the, the persons who committed that act of terror, um, maybe what we now know as 9-11 would not have occurred. <laughs> but it was ignored, you know, people felt that we got our due because we were um, helping the, um, the communists and um, we deserve what we got. So you're quite right that um, Guyana was uh, punished because of its support for African liberation struggle. And later on, we started to find that um, we ran into a lot of problems with the international financial institutions. 
because Guyana became a sort of a pari state in the Western Hemisphere. So we paid in money, by, you know, the actual donor. We paid in blood because our, our, um, our uh, people were bombed out of the air in the Cubana. And we also paid by being diplomatically isolated in what was called destabilization. That is, some Western countries tried to make Guyana unstable, and that is when we went into some economic problems in the, um, from the uh, 1980s. Sir, even though there has been much talk about the Oliver Tambo Award for the late president, there has also been probably an equal amount of silence, especially from the current government of Guyana. Do you believe that maybe because of the consequences of Mr. Barnum's um, helping the South African uh, liberation, do you believe that that is responsible somewhat for that silence? Because after all, it, yes, it may not be a PNC or an APNU government, but this is a man who was the president of Guyana. Like you, I believe that the government of Guyana should be more vocal in this matter because um, Forbes Burnham was a president, he's a citizen of Guyana, and if an attempt is made to besmirch his reputation, or to suggest that he's not fit for an international award. The government should have come out and made a statement by now, but mm -hmm. it has failed to do so. And I'm, I don't know the mind of the government, but I can only um, surmise that uh, they have a good reason for remaining silent. But Burnham is a distinguished citizen and he deserves the award. Now, sir, if not for the Oliver Tambo Award to the late President Burnham, Persons now would not, would probably would not have known that Burnham made such a great contribution to South Africa. What is the People's National Congress reform doing or plan to do to ensure that the public knows, especially our young people, knows about the works that Burnham did, not only in South Africa, but generally? Well, to start with, I have written President Zuma of South Africa. Uh, we've also prepared a dossier which uh, tries to chronicle, which chronicles the contribution that um, Forbes Burnham made, both as a head of government and the government of Ghana as, a, as an entity, as a state, made to the liberation of Southern Africa. Uh, there are other means of disseminating information. We have a display at Congress Place, the party's headquarters, and three of the books which were published in the 1980s uh, concerning the liberation of Southern Africa are in our collection and they are there for people to see. Um, we don't intend to reprint those books at the present time, but speeches have been given in the National Assembly, and uh, meetings were held, conferences were held in Guyana, international conferences. Uh, Oliver Tambo actually came to Guyana uh, to, and we actually named the street uh, Nelson Mandela Street after the, the well-known leader of um, South Africa. So there's so many things we've done uh, that I think people will be astonished. We actually gave scholarships for South African and uh, students from other countries to study in Guyana at no cost, uh, and they returned to their country after they graduated, um, you know, in order to help them to build the human resource base when they became free. We actually provided passports, you know, the statute of limitations allow me to say these things now, 30 <laughs> years have passed. But um, many of the liberation fight fighters were unable to travel around the world because they weren't given a passport by their own countries. And we gave them Guyana passports to allow them to move around the world. Um, so there is so much that we have done that people need to know, and I hope when this dossier comes out, people can take a more objective view of what uh, contribution we made. It is a pity that um, there will always be political differences and there will always be racial differences. Now, regardless of the ethnicity of the people involved, um, everyone knows that uh, the African continent at the beginning of the last century was the most divided continent in the world. There was a major conference in Berlin in the last quarter of the, um, the 19th century. Again, forgive my history. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the European countries 
simply had a conference in Berlin, which was then the capital of Germany, and divided up Africa into zones of influence. So you had Germans, they were the places like Tanganyika and um, Togo were, and, and Namibia were actually German colonies. You had French colonies, um, Senegal, uh, um, Ivory Coast, Mali, um, uh, Burkina, what is now Burkina Faso. Then you had British colonies, um, you had Spanish colonies, you had Portuguese colonies. So the entire country, um, co uh, continent, except for Ethiopia, came under European rule. Even Algeria, huge countries, were under French rule, Libya, um, Tunisia. Um, it is unimaginable that Europeans could have uh, cut up a whole country, a whole continent among themselves. This is the situation that we were faced with at the beginning of the last century and that is why we had to struggle so, so hard to bring colonialism to an end in that continent. You mentioned earlier uh, racial differences. Um, this may be a bit of an uncomfortable question, sir, but do you believe that uh, Mr. Burnham's belief in, in, in the liberation of South Africa would have somehow uh, made some persons refer to him as a racist? Well, they might have done so, but the point I was trying to make a minute ago is that no other part of the world uh, suffered or still suffered from uh, colonial occupation and domination like Africa. Many of the countries in Asia had won their freedom. Uh, Vietnam was a colony, Cambodia was a colony, India was a colony, Pakistan, uh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, but they were able to win their freedom in the 1940s. Um, even in Southeast Asia, you had countries like Indonesia, which fought against the Dutch and won their, won their independence. But it was the Portuguese who held on most rapaciously to the colonies. I mean, even in 1960, France had started to grant a limited a form of independence to its own colonies. Um, Ghana became free in 1957. Nigeria became free in 1960. So, the other Europeans had started to decolonize, but at the time we were speaking about in the 1970s, there were still colonies, and only Africa. There were no more colonies in, um, on, in South America. Most of the Latin American countries had, made, had been freed, and in fact, um, by mid-70s, um, um, you can say that uh, Suriname became free. And um, right now in the continent of South America, it's probably only Guyana, and uh, Guyana doesn't consider itself a colony, it's part of metropolitan France. But the point is that Burnham's attention was directed to Africa because Africa was the only continent that still was affected by such widespread, widespread um, colonial rule. And it's not racial at all. Um, he felt sure, and many of us felt at the time, still feel that once you have that level of apartheid, that level of um, uh, domination, um, particularly since the domination had a racial tone, the Portuguese were white-skinned Europeans, and the persons living in Mozambique and Angola and Guinea-Bissau were largely black-skinned Africans. So there was a racial dimension, but that was not the reason why we support. We supported the removal of colonial rule everywhere, everywhere. And um, we were free, and we wanted the rest of the Caribbean to be free, and we wanted the rest of Africa to be free. Throughout this broadcast, much has been said about um, Burnham's contribution to South African uh, liberation, if I may call it that. But if I'm to play devil's advocate here for a bit, 28 years after his death, why does it matter to the ordinary person walking around Guyana, bread and butter issues? Why is it important 28 years after Burnham's death? It matters because he was a Guyanese citizen. It matters because um, he made a contribution and that contribution has not been officially recognized as yet. It matters because people do not know and people um, have attacked Forbes Burnham um, for things he never did. And this is one of the several things we can show that he did, which was humanitarian, which was um, recognized around the world. But we Guyanese seem not to have recognized that.
From re reports, obvious reports, uh, we know that the award should have been given on the 27th of April. Now, how soon are you expecting a response from the South African government and what would probably be uh, PNC's next move? Well, we have taken a move already. We have actually written, I have actually written to President Zuma. Um, and the award is still posted on the website, the South African government website. It has not been withdrawn. Um, it's simply that the actual presentation of the award, and you know, there's a medal and there's actually a walking stick, um, that has been held up because of the, I assume, I don't know what is in the mind of the South African government. Um, but I expect that, you know, within a month the matter should be settled. I don't think it can take longer than that because the case of Mr. Burnham's award is persuasive. I don't want to make comparisons, but um, when you look at the list of people who have uh, received the award, um, there's no doubt that Mr. Burnham's contribution is substantial and should be among them. Oh. I don't want to say better than, but certainly he should be among them. So you don't expect a complete withdrawal instead of just it being deferred? Well, it has not been withdrawn. It, as I said, the award, um, the granting of the award um, has been made. It's on the website. It's just that the presentation of the actual um, item have not be, has not been made. Okay, mm -hmm. and can we uh, finally, sir, on, on this edition of the public interest, can we look forward to seeing, um, you mentioned a walking stick and a medal, do you think we can look forward to seeing something like that displayed some part of Congress place or any other office um, authorized by PNC and yourself? Well, at present it's a matter for the family. Okay. Uh, he has a daughter, uh, Roxanne uh, Burnham Van Ness Charles, and she was the one who was actually invited to go to Pretoria to receive the award. And um, I know that in my days in the Defense Force, there were some um, displays, and certainly as leader of the People's National Congress, we have accumulated photographs and books and other materials, and we want to put those things on display. And if the family agrees, we'd be very happy. If not, we can produce replicas so that the Guyanese people can see what good work um, the fellow leader of the PNC has done. Thank you very much, sir. Leader of the People's National Congress Reform and Leader of the Opposition, Mr. David Granger. But before I wrap up completely, sir, I'd like to give you an opportunity to greet our mothers because um, that's the next significant day in our country. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Malika. You know, a few years ago, I studied in Nigeria, and it was a very popular song, folk song at the time, you know. Um, you can get another brother, you can get another sister, but you can never get another mother. And I always remember that song. Um, the role of the mother is um, not fully recognized in Guyana, and I hope that we take this opportunity on Mother's Day to thank our mothers, even if they're not alive, say a prayer for them, for their souls. And uh, those of you who are lucky still to have mothers, call them, do something special. and. Just try to imagine how much they did it for you. When you look at, the, at a young child, the child is completely helpless. A, child, a human child, a human baby is helpless. And it is a mother's love that has made us into what we are today. So say thanks. Thank you very much, sir. This has been another edition of The Public Interest. I am Malaika Ramsey. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye.